Old powers waken, shadows stir, an age of wonder and terror will soon be upon us, an age for gods and heroes. The glass candles are burning, and you're listening to the Obsidian Knights Podcast. Hello, my sweet summer children. I'm back with the juice to get you through the long night. Today, we are diving into the mind of Arya Stark in Arya 3, Chapter 32 of A Game of Thrones, the first book in the A Song of Ice and Fire series. And today, I am joined by Bright Roar and Tubi, my Discord moderators. Would you guys... um? like to introduce yourself and let everybody know about our discord server and all that jazz hi guys i'm bright roar i am the queen's guard commander of the gray area discord channel i am the one who runs our book clubs we do uh, a song of ice and fire main series on mondays and a song of ice and fire expansion on thursdays we're currently on a clash of kings about uh, I'd say about a fourth of the way through. So I hope you guys can come and join us after hearing this. Hi, I am Tui. I am the Hand of the Queen and head moderator over at the Discord server. And I um, I just kind of run shit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she's my Tywin. She's my Tywin <laughs> sister. <laughs> so also you can contact Tubi on Twitter at Nims Shadow. Uh, to schedule to be a co-host on an episode of Obsidian Nights podcast so you can sit down chat with me about a chapter of A Song of Ice and Fire. She will schedule you. She's also in the process of making an Instagram. I know a lot of you have reached out to me on Instagram to sign up to do an episode and I will be giving that information to her but she's also going to be making an Instagram so when she makes that I will put that information in the description box. Also, you can join the Discord. The link will be in the description box. And I'll also pin the link at the top of the comments. But now that all the housekeeping stuff is out of the way, we're going to be talking about Arya. And Arya is one of my favorite characters. And I really love Arya in A Game of Thrones when she's still just a little cute little kid. And she hasn't been so corrupted yet. Um <laughs> This chapter, she's in King's Landing, and let's just get right into it. So the chapter opens up with Arya chasing cats. The one-eared black Tom arched his back and hissed at her. Arya padded down the alley, balanced lightly on the balls of her bare feet, listening to the flutter of her heart, breathing slow, deep breaths, quiet as a shadow, she told herself, light as a feather. The tomcat watched her come his eyes wary. Catching cats was hard. Her hands were covered with half-heeled scratches, and both knees were scabbed over where she had scraped them raw in tumbles. At first, even the cook's huge fat kitchen cat had been able to elude her, but Serio had kept her at it day and night. When she'd run to him with her hands bleeding, he said, so slow, be quicker, girl. Your enemies will give you more than scratches. So basically, Arya is running around the red keep trying to catch stray cats i don't know if you've ever tried to catch a feral cat that shit ain't easy catching a domestic cat is hard like yeah. your own pet yeah yeah <laughs> so i can't imagine trying to catch one that's like hauling ass trying to get away from you and that doesn't like people and not used to people yeah. yeah, and it's turning on you and swatting at you constantly. Ugh. Yes. So the Red Keep is full of cats. And then Arya goes on to, like, describe the different kinds of cats. Um, this is something that Sirio has her doing. And this will help her become still as a shadow. Like, this is, this is training. This is going to help her be more stealth, be more quick, be more agile. That's weird training to me. It is weird training. And the, the lessons that he gives her, uh, calm as still water, strong as a bear, fierce as a wolverine. I have a whole list. Swift as a deer. 
uh, quiet as a shadow, light as a feather, quick as a snake, smooth as summer silk, and still as a stone. They're all telling her to imitate something else and change her behavior and become something or someone else. So it really plays into her changing her whole identity later. Yeah. These are all of the the ground rules that she needs for later training in the House of Black and White, which is just crazy. And it's a lot when you look at Arya, like there's that, like that whole list of like her serial training. But then there's then there's also like her whole nicknames like all the nicknames and things that she goes by throughout the books they're all like changing your identity and i think that's like with aria where every other main character in this story like with john snow john snow it's it's all about becoming who he's meant to be finding out who he really is with the generis it's like that it's they're all about like finding their self and with Arya, it's about losing herself. Like she knows exactly who she is and it's about losing who she is while, while everybody else is trying to become who they are. And I really Ooh, like how opposite. George did that. Hmm. Yeah, me too. I didn't even think of it that way. Can we get back to this black one-eared cat, this <laughs> this Lannister hating bastard? <laughs> you think it's Valerian? It is Valerian. Oh, he steals Tyrion's sure. food. <laughs> he's hissing at Tommen. He attacks Joffrey. He's described as older than Sin, so we know he's been in that castle for a long fucking time. Mm-hmm. But another thing about this cat is he's called the Black Bastard. So we have a secret Targaryen who's called a Black Bastard and described as the true king <laughs> of the castle. Like Jon Snow foreshadowing. <laughs> Jon Snow all over it. This horrible one-eared black cat is just completely described like John and hates Lannisters. He he's, does. He, I mean, he's literally called a black bastard, the, the true king. So Come for on. the people who have never read the books before and you're just listening along as we go, um, Balerion, the black cat, was actually the cat of Rhaenys Targaryen, Rhaegar's daughter with Ilya Martell. So Rainey's had a little black kitten named Balerion. And I guess when she died, her cat stayed in the Red Keep. But they never outright say that it's Balerion. Like nobody outright says this is Balerion. They call him just the old black tomcat or the black bastard. But he does things that definitely point to him being Balerion. Yeah, Mm -hmm. like hopping up on a table and stealing Tywin Lannister's food. I would give so much money to see the look on his face. Right. (laughs) When this cat (laughs) hops up and steals his fucking turkey leg. (laughs) He's he's old. He's old as hell. Well, let, let me read his description. One by one, Arya had chased them down and snatched them up and brought them proudly to Cereal Pharrell. All but this one, this one eared black devil of a tomcat. That's the real king of this castle right there, one of the gold cloaks had told her. Older than sin and twice as mean, one time the king was feasting the queen's father and that black bastard hopped on the table and snatched a roast quail right out of Lord Tywin's fingers. Robert laughed so hard he liked to burst. You stay away from that one, child. So, and he's actually the same age. Like, if he's older than sin... He could be, what, like 15 years old? That 15 years old is a pretty old cat, right? Yeah, Yeah, I mean, cats can live to be in their, like, 18, 19, 20s. Yeah, and Robert's Rebellion was, what, 16 years before? 16, yeah. 16, Mm mm-hmm. So, I think it's Valerian. Like, I did a whole video on on Valerian, the black cat. I might have watched that in preparation for this. (laughs) (laughs) so a lot of this is aria trying to catch like a lot of the beginning of the chapter is aria trying to catch balerion and she's like chasing him all around the red keep and he's leading her so she's going to places that she necessarily hasn't been before like but uh, she will be going to twice around the Tower of the Hand, mm-hmm. the Inner Bailey, which in the uh, in a later chapter, later Aria chapter, she is uh, sneaking around the castle and she <clears throat> she wants to 
she sees the gold cloaks marching around, but she doesn't really, um, she doesn't know what side they're on. So she doesn't call them out. So it's almost like the first time that she really has a mistrust, a real mistrust in the, you know, authority. And then to the stables, a couple other places, then to the stables where she has her first kill, first person she ever kills, and then to the trader's walk where, unfortunately, some of her family (laughs) will be there. Mm -hmm. So this cat is leading her to significant, upcoming significant places in her life. Yeah, that's true. Changes that will be made that happen in those places to her life. So I think that he is intentionally leading her, you know, as a warning, basically. Yeah, well, and twice twice around the Tower of the Hand, I think, is the the two separate but equal plots on on Ned. I mean, there's people conspiring against her, against him. And twice around the tower to me is very significant. Because we have Littlefinger, who's doing everything in his power to undermine and get under Ned's skin. And later is Cersei, doing everything she can to get rid of Ned as a threat. Yeah, that's interesting. You know, George does all of that stuff. Like, people probably, like, regular readers probably look at us like, these crazy people <laughs> dissecting <laughs> dissecting this book like he really meant to do that. No, he really meant to no, do he really that. Like, oh, he sure. really meant to do it. It's It's too on the nose for it not to be meant. Like, you don't Co- you don't have coincidences like that every chapter, every paragraph. It doesn't happen like that. So yeah, he really meant to do foreshadowing mm-hmm. and to overlay like all this symbolism and things like that. He does that. That's how he writes. That's why it's so good. Yeah, and I think especially in the first book is so pertinent because he he said you know all the answers to the entire series can be found in the first book. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yep. Um. <laughs> This is funny. So she catches the cat, kisses him in between the eyes, and then he like claws her right in the face. And yeah, he's first. <laughs> but he's like, Rawr! like, get the fuck off me. And then she bumps into Tom and, and Marcella. Um, basically, they're like, what, what are you doing to that cat? And they think, or Marcella thinks that Arya is a boy. It's a ragged boy, she calls him. Yes. Mm-hmm. Her. <laughs> Ragged, dirty, smelly boy, says Tommen, too. Mm-hmm. And they, so they don't realize who she is, which this is also foreshadowing of how she's going to be able to escape. She's going to escape kind of from where she is right now, looking like a ragged boy. Right. And all of those, those serial lessons, the calm, strong, fierce, swift, all of that comes back in her being able to so quickly and effortlessly slip into, yes, I'm just a ragged boy. Just run. (laughs) You're just a ragged boy. They don't know who you are. And she slips into that persona so quickly and easily that you can tell that all of those lessons are really paying off. Yes, they are. So um, she like basically just jumps, like falls right into it. Yep. I'm a boy. Let me bow down to them so they don't realize who I am because Sansa's going to be never talk to me again and Septim Mordain's going to be mortified. Because at the end of the day, Arya is a highborn lady. She's not supposed to be crawling around the dungeons of King's Landing chasing cats. Yeah, in filthy, ripped clothes. And <laughs> just smelly. And and gross. Yeah. yeah. She's not She's supposed to be like Sansa, sitting and sewing and singing. And what is with all the Starks knocking over Tommen? <laughs> <laughs> when they're back at Winterfell, Bran knocks him on his ass when they're when they're playing at swords, mm-hmm. and Arya bowls him over and knocks him to the ground when she runs away. It probably has something to do with him actually in the future. Like I do not think Tommen's death is going to go down like it did on the show. Um, I. And then, like, so when we did the Bran chapter where Tom and Bran are fighting and Bran beats him, mm-hmm. I don't think it's going to – I think it's going to be Tom and who Bran basically overthrows as king. And I think it's symbolism for both times, even with Arya and with, with Bran, that Bran is going to be king. Because I, I do buy that part of the ending. I do think that Bran is going to end up as king. 
but I don't think I can see that too. I don't think he's going to be king in King's Landing, though. I think he's going to be a weirwood king in Winterfell. Hmm. Like the, I don't think King's Landing is going to exist anymore. Like, yeah, I think King's Landing is going to be completely destroyed. Yeah, that's that would be the the complete and total smashing of the wheel. (laughs) Right, because if we're doing like if we're doing like history repeats, right? And we look at, and we like, we always compare Daenerys to Valerians or the Valerians to the Valerians, right? When they actually went ham on the Giscari, they obliterated the whole mm-hmm. empire. Like they sold their, their fields with salt and lime. So that's the kind of like, if they're going that route, I feel like it's going to be something like that. It's not going to be no, like, let's be honest here. If a dragon burnt king's landing how we saw a dragon burn king's landing in episode six king's landing would not uh, in in episode five king's landing would not have looked like king's landing in episode six no no, it would have been so much more fucked up yeah Yeah. dragon fire is way hotter and he's he's decimated the whole city and they act like oh yeah no we just need to refinish these buildings it'll be fine right like the the fact that they were sitting at the small council table like nothing happened. Was right. So <laughs> I was like, okay. So the whole castle collapsed on top of Jamie and, and Cersei, but the, the small council chamber was totally fine. Totally <laughs> fine. Not a thing out of place. And like no it one says like shining. how Brand <laughs> got wheelchaired up all those steps. Like no one talks about it. I'm just like, they are always talking about the serpentine steps and all of these steps in the red keep. And I'm just like, <laughs> okay, whatever. But, um, so Arya gets away. She runs away from Tom and Marcella and the guards and all of them. She runs away from them and she is like trying to lose them. And she winds up in tunnels and cellars and dungeons Arya was out of breath and quite thoroughly lost. She was in for it now if they had recognized her, but she didn't think they had. She moved too fast, swift as a deer. She hunkered down in the dark against a damp stone wall and listened for the pursuit. But the only sound was the beating of her own heart in a distant drip of water. Quiet as a shadow, she told herself. She wondered where she was. When they had first come to King's Landing, she used to have bad dreams about getting lost in the castle. Father said the Red Keep was smaller than Winterfell, but in her dreams it had been immense, an endless stone maze with walls that seemed to shift and change behind her. She would find herself wandering down gloomy halls, past faded tapestries, descending endless circular stairs, darting through courtyards or over bridges, her shouts echoing unanswered. In some of the rooms, the red stone walls would seem to drip blood, and nowhere could she find a window. Sometimes she would hear her father's voice, but always from a long way off. And no matter how hard she ran after it, it would grow fainter and fainter until it faded to nothing and Arya was alone in the dark. I think that dream is definitely foreshadowing that she's going to lose her father, Ned Stark, and also that she's going to be the lone wolf of the Stark pack Mm -hmm. because she does end up alone. And all of the Stark children have a hard road, and I won't take that from any of them. But she has one of the hardest because she's kind of like living with outlaws and the hound. Like she sees her mom die. She sees the Red Wedding. She pulls Catelyn Stark's body from the river while she's warged into Nymeria. Right. Right. So, yeah, she's traumatized. Very, very, yeah, very definitely. Very nice. And oh. there's something about this this dream that smacks of of chapter twenty six and John's fourth point of view. The he tells Sam, crypts. yeah, he tells Sam about this dream that he has. And in both of these dreams, there's long empty hallways, endless descending circular stairs. Their shouts are echoing unanswered. Arya says she sometimes hears Ned, and most nights John is searching for Ned in his dreams. And they're both alone in the dark. And at the end of of John explaining this dream to Sam, Sam asks him, do you ever find anyone in your dream? And John responds, no one. Mm, I didn't Mm. know that. Mm -hmm. That's a callback, definitely. 
Yeah, that's definitely foreshadowing. And John is calling back to Arya's, like, what Arya's going to be. Right. No one. Yep. So it's very dark. And she's kind of scared. Like, she's, like, sitting there. She's hugging her, her bare knees tight against her chest. And she's shivering. And she actually reaches a room. And she sees, like, these shapes around her. Huge, empty eyes stared at her, hungrily through the gloom, and dimly she saw the jagged shadows of long teeth. She had lost the count. She closed her eyes and bit her lip and sent the fear away. When she looked again, the monsters would be gone, would never have been. She pretended that Syria was beside her in the dark, whispering in her ear, calm as still waters, she told herself, strong as a bear, Fierce as a wolverine, she opened her eyes again. The monsters were still there, but the fear was gone. Arya got to her feet, moving warily. The heads were all around her. She touched one, curious, wondering if it was real. Her fingertips brushed a massive jaw. It felt real enough. So basically, what Arya is seeing is the skulls of the Targaryen dragon. So she's in the dungeons of King's Landing of the Red Keep, and she's seeing the dragon skulls that used to be on the wall of the throne room. Yeah. And right after that passage, she says, it's dead. She says it out loud. It's just a skull. It can't hurt me. Yet somehow the monster seemed to know she was there. She could feel its empty eyes watching her through its gloom, and there was something in that dim, cavernous room that did not love her. That was also Tyrion's reaction to the skulls, mm -hmm. and how Ned felt when he saw them in the throne room years and years and years ago. They all had the same reaction. Kind of like dreadful, like a dreadful reaction. Yeah. I mean, I wonder what that is. I've never actually paid attention to that. I wonder if it's, if it's the way, it, it's that fear that fearful respect and that fear that the, the dragons themselves gave the Targaryens. And once those dragons were dead, the fear was still kind of there, but people could overcome it because those dragons were dead. They were no longer a threat. Mm -hmm. But I think that they kind of represent the, the, the respectful fear that the populace had for the Targaryens when the dragons, the power of the dragons were at their height. Yeah, I, it could be that. It could also be like the characters that we have now, Ned Stark, Robert Baratheon, Arya, Bran, they've never seen a living dragon. And just seeing the skull of one has to be amazing. It's kind of like a comparison for us would be like seeing a dinosaur skull and seeing just how massive it is. It could be right. just that kind of fear. But I think it's something more than that. I think it's, I don't know. Hmm. It's kind of interesting though. Like what do you guys think that are listening? Let us know in the comments what you think that means that everyone gets this bad feeling that, that the skulls don't like them, the dragon skulls. They kind of get a dreadful feeling. Okay. So Arya is... Oh, there oh, was that other part. Oh, I'm so sorry. There was that other part when she was in the dark. Um, ah, yeah. And she goes, she was blind. She says, I'm blind. I can't see. Yeah. Then she says, a water dancer sees with, with all of her senses. And so all of Sirio's lessons, again, being reinforced by the kindly man. And she, yeah. And she will go blind. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. She will go blind for a time. To me, one of the most interesting parts of this chapter is Varys and Illyrio. Yes. So uh, we're going to talk about that. So as Arya is down there, she sees the light of a single torch um, and two men she made out. So she doesn't know who they are. She just sees like their shadows. And she says that their, their shadows are tall as giants. And she could hear their voices echoing up the shaft. Found one bastard, one said. The rest will come soon. A day, two days, a fortnight. And when he learns the truth, what will he do? A second voice asked in the liquid accents of the free cities. The gods alone know, the first voice said. Arya could see a wisp of gray smoke drifting up off the torch, writhing like a snake as it rose. The fools tried to kill his son, and what's worse, they made a mummer's farce of it. 
He's not a man to put that aside, I warn you. The wolf and the lion will soon be at each other's throats, whether we will it or not. Too soon, too soon, the voice with the accent complained. What good is war now? We are not ready. Delay. As well, beg me to stop time. Do you take me for a wizard? The other chuckled. No less. Flames licked at the cold air. The tall shadows were almost on top of her. An instant later, the man holding the torch climbed into her sight, his companion beside him. Arya crept back away from the well, dropped to her stomach, and flattened herself against the wall. She held her breath as the men reached the top of the steps. What would you have me do? asked the torchbearer. A stout man in a leather half cape, even in heavy boots, his feet seemed to glide soundlessly over the ground. A round scarred face and a stubble of dark beard showed under his steel cap, and he wore mail over boiled leather. There was something oddly familiar about him. If one hand can die, why not a second, replied the man with the accent and the forked yellow beard. You have danced this dance before, my friend. He was no one Arya had ever seen before. She was certain of it. And then Varys says back to that, before is not now, and this hand is not the other. So, okay, I want to ask you guys something first. Do you think Varys is a good character? Is he a good guy to you? I think so. Okay. I Tubi thinks so. Right. I think I think that he is what he says he is, which is uh, a man of the people. Uh I don't know. I want to I'd make him a neutral character because he's willing to do whatever it takes, mm-hmm. which can be a really bad thing, but he's also thinking of the little guy. So is I, he really though? I I, I, I mean we're going to talk about a little guy. <laughs> he does want what's best for the realm, but I think that what makes him a great character is that he's willing to go to any lengths to achieve that. To him, the ends are always justified by the means. So I will say I do not think he's a good character. Um, I think he's gray, but in this, like, I lean more to him being darker than actually being a good person because he says that he cares about the little guy, but I don't believe him. I don't believe him because he thinks that Aegon is best for the realm. That doesn't make him any different than like a Tywin Lannister who thinks that his grandson is best for the realm because Barristan doesn't know if Aegon is what's best for the realm. And what really sold me on Barris not being a good person is Barris killing Kevin Lannister. I'm jumping way far ahead here, but (laughs) just to give context, in A Dance with Dragons, Kevin Lannister, like Cersei has been knocked down. Cersei has been knocked down. Tommen is king, but he has a regent until he comes of age. So Kevin Lannister is his regent. And Kevin Lannister is like doing all of this good stuff for the realm. There's finally like a glimmer of hope that it's going to be peaceful. Varys kills Kevin. Varys kills Maester Pycelle. And when what he tells Kevin really bothers me. Like, all the good work you've been doing is all about to go to shit. Tommen, like, Cersei's going to blame the Tyrells. The Tyrells are going to blame Cersei. Like, it's going to be another war. Like, if you really cared about the people, you would let who's on the throne stay on the throne. Because Kevin Lannister, in my opinion, is a good person. Like, he's not an evil guy and he's making peace with people that he shouldn't necessarily make peace with just for the better of the realm and another thing that really like if you look in the past we see the tourney of harrenhal right it was supposedly put on by rhaegar because rhaegar wanted to overthrow his father because his father was losing his fucking mind and Rhaegar needed to win support of the lord the high lords of westeros so he put on this tourney and Varys informed on Rhaegar and brought the Mad King to the tourney and spoiled the whole fucking plans. So, like, if that, you, I never understood his reasoning for that. If you yeah. really cared for the realm, would you do these things? And I, he might really care for the realm. He might really care for the realm. But I guess it's more like what gives you the right to decide for everybody who should be 
king. No, absolutely. I agree with yeah. that 100%. I can, I can twist myself in knots and, and excuse away him killing Kevin Lannister by just wanting to dethrone the Lannisters completely. And it says in their, their conversation that they needed a civil war. They needed that chaos in yeah. order for some new party to come in and conquer and take over. So I, I can understand how killing Kevin would would be justified in in that context that that was what he needed again the means justifying the ends yeah mm-hmm. um he he wants to you know his plan b of the the dothraki bringing the dothraki over once you know the baby's born and, and drogo's ready to to cross the sea if danny can talk him into it which i is still very confusing to me if they're putting all of their their eggs into Fagon and yeah. John Con, and because this this whole conversation makes it seem like they're both really gunning for Danny, you know, mm-hmm. like they're out there for her, mm-hmm. and we know they're not. Right. They've done everything to get rid of Danny, to remove her as a threat. But I wonder at this point if George had thought about Aegon. Did George know at this point? that he was going to have a Fagon character. Maybe. Because it always confused me as to why he gave Danny the dragon eggs and he wouldn't give them to Fagon. Fagon comes about four books after this book. So I just don't think he had thought of Fagon yet at this point. But But we do know that in A Dance with Dragons, they kind of think that Illyrio basically says it to Tyrion, like, we thought that she was just going to die out there mm-hmm. on the Dothraki Sea and Viserys too, but she's not weak it, uh, when it comes to Daenerys. Like, they're basically using Daenerys and Viserys as pawns Absolutely. for Aegon. But I wonder, like, did George know at this point that it was going to be Aegon. I really think that Viserys is a secret Targaryen. Like, I know. We, I, I, I don't think he's a Blackfire. We will yeah, never maybe. find out. We will never find out if he's a Targaryen, if he's a Blackfire. If he, I definitely think he has Targaryen blood. Definitely think of the Blackfire line. Well, and I don't think that we would have a whole other story, meaning the Night of the Seven Kingdoms, talking about a Targaryen pretending not to be a Targaryen who keeps his head shaved so that no one would know he had silver hair and was hairless, a Targaryen. Hairless <laughs> as an egg. And yeah, then, and Varys is even described that way, hairless as an egg. And then Varys also, when you look at Targaryen names, like Jaehaerys. Yeah, with the Y. Yeah, mm-hmm. Jaehaerys, Daenerys, Viserys, Varys. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And he's always like, not always, but like he's kind of tries to lie about where he's from on the low. But what one interesting thing that Illyrio says, he said, "You've danced this dance before." Yeah, if one what hand can he die. Going on about there. Yeah. So did Varys have a hand in killing John Aaron? I don't think it was about John Aaron. I think it was about some of those hands that the Mad King killed. Mm-hmm. Because the right. Mad we King about, killed a about, lot of hands. Uh, Carlton we- Chelstead, who, um, who was killed because he refused to go along with the wildfire plot with Eris, and we were wondering if he intentionally led Carlton Chelstead to the wildfire. Yeah, to bring all of this about in the first place. Mm-hmm. Very possible. No one knows the Red Keep or King's Landing like Varys. Exactly. No. So, yeah. I mean, he's gray. He's definitely gray. He's definitely in the gray area. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, basically, Varys is like, you know, if he does not bestir himself soon, it may be too late. This is no longer a game for two players, if ever it was. Stannis Baratheon and Lysa Aaron have fled beyond my reach, and the whispers say they are gathering swords around them. The Knight of the Flowers writes Highgarden, urging his lord father to send his sister to court. The girl is a maid of 14, sweet and beautiful and tractable, and Lord Renly and Sir Loris intend that Robert should bed her, wed her, and make her a new queen. 
Littlefinger, the gods only know what game the Littlefinger is playing. Yet Lord Stark's the one who troubles my sleep. He has the bastard, he has the book, and soon enough he'll have the truth. And now his wife has abducted Tyrion Lannister thanks to Littlefinger's meddling. Lord Tywin will take that for an outrage, and Jaime has a queer affection for the imp. If the Lannisters move north, that will bring the Tullys in as well. Delay, you say. Make haste, I reply. Even the finest of jugglers cannot keep a hundred balls in the air forever. So Illyrio wants Varys to like keep the war from breaking out. And Varys is like, look, the war is happening, whether you like it or not. I can't stop it. You need to hurry up with Khal Drogo and Daenerys or Aegon or whoever you're bringing to Westeros to capitalize on this war. You need to do it now. And I find yeah, it interesting. It, it slipped out of his control. He he has a lot of power in the sense that he has a lot of information. He has his little birds. He knows what's going on. He knows what's happening. But he doesn't really have the power t- to change any of it. He can't, like he says, I can't stop this. There's nothing I can do. These people are beyond my reach. Yes. And you know, another thing, when we're talking about bears being good or evil, there is no good man that takes little children and cuts their tongues out. No good man does that. Uh, point okay. gray. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Next. <Fair enough. laughs> Fair enough. Ned, Ned started. My gray got a little darker. Okay. Yeah, all right. Okay. <laughs> we see you. We see I, you. I just think it's super fucking twisted. Like you take these kids and you cut their tongue out. Like you didn't like what was done to you. Like you were taken, you were made into a eunuch for a magical spell. But then you do the same thing to children. Like you take their tongues out so you can employ them. I just find him. Yeah, and you, did you realize that Illyrio calls him a wizard and a sorcerer both in this conversation yes and you would think with Varys's distaste for wizards and sorcery in general that referring to him as such would be like offensive quite offensive to him yeah he wouldn't really care for that but he just kind of is like yeah Yeah. (laughs) okay (laughs) He says, do you take me for a wizard? And he says, no less. You're more than a juggler, old friend. You're a true sorcerer. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't know. Yeah, it's kind of. Like, that would have pissed me off. I'm going (laughs) to cut my junk off. So Arya winds up getting out, like, through kind of like, I guess, would that be the sewer that she got out through? I think so. Oh, wait, I'm so sorry. I have one more note on that. Before Arya leaves. So Varys, the disguise that he's in, he's disguised that says he's wearing a half cape and a steel cap and mail over boiled leather. We know from later on in a, I think it's a Jamie POV, that that is Rugen. That's the underjailer. Right. The and jailer. Varys has got like unmitigated access to the black cells because he has, he like moonlights as an underjailer. Yes, and I totally, totally think that it's Varys that put that old Tyrell gold. Oh, absolutely, under that pot in the corner? Yes. Absolutely. That was all Varys. He definitely planted that. So fuck with Cersei. (laughs) Yes. (laughs) He's going to put another bee in that bitch's pot. Yes. But But also, like, who's in the black cells right now? Jacken, maybe. Jacken. Jacken's in the black cells. So did he put him there? Oh, we can did go. He hire him for that would be another whole like episode <laughs> if we go into who put Jacken in the black cells. Because okay, well, let's schedule under- that because we need to talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm under the impression that if he's in the black cells, it's because he wants to be in the black cells. I think mm-hmm. so too. He he mm-hmm. would be able to get himself out of any situation yes. that he found himself in. Yes. So if he was in the black cells, he was there for a reason, either because he was asked to be there or because he wanted to be there to further his own agenda. 
Well, there's a lot of people in the black cells actually right now because with the tourney, like people were getting arrested left and right. There were so many people in King's Landing doing like having knife fights on the street and right. all doing kinds of stuff. Rat shit with their head rat friends. Yes. Like heads <laughs> being found floating in the pool and stuff. Yeah. Right. So there's a lot of people in the black cells, but I think Jacken is definitely in there as we speak. Well, because that's where Varys and Illyrio are heading. They're heading into the Black Cells. Yes. And you know that Robert um, wants to kill Daenerys. Right. So I don't know if they bring... And, and they talk, and I think Littlefinger brings up like, well, we could hire the Faceless Men. It just so happens there's a Faceless Men in the Black Cells. Right. And interestingly enough, Littlefinger knows all about like how much they cost and where you might be able to find one. Like, yeah, and little finger. It's interesting to me. From Bravos. Exactly. It's interesting to me that he has that connection also, like you said, because his family is from Bravos. Mm-hmm. So Arya actually gets out of the red keep through the sewer where it empties into the river. And like, she stinks. Her clothes are like shitty. Like she. <laughs> She, I don't, well, see, she says that she swam in the river until she felt clean and crawled out shivering. Okay, but that's the river that, like, the shit the goes into the city empties into, so that's fine yeah. for her. I'm surprised she didn't get, like, E. coli and Staff some other. Mercy. Yeah. Yeah. She got some. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But she's actually really far from the castle and, like, away from King's Landing. And I, I guess she can see, like, she, she knows how to get to the ki- the red keep because the red keep is on Aegon's high hill so all she like it sits above everything in the city so all she has to do is like look at it and just right. just look up it. and you know where you are yeah mm-hmm. so she when she gets to the gates the guards are like get away from here beggar girl <laughs> like and she's like <laughs> my father is the hand of the king and <laughs> they laugh at that shit they're like okay <laughs> So finally they take her to her dad and like her dad's like, what the fuck? Again, Ned had his guards out looking for Arya. Like people have been looking for Arya in every chapter that Arya actually appears in, like in the (laughs) Riverlands when the whole lady situation happened, Arya went missing and now she's went missing again. Like that's Arya's whole thing is getting lost and going missing and people not being able to find her. Like, that's her whole spill. Yeah, and then she just shows up like nothing ever happened. Yeah. With some new stories to tell. <laughs> kind of like an outdoor cat. It's part of her charm. Comes and goes when she pleases. Arya goes to Ned, and Ned is like, you know, Jesus. And, and Arya's trying to tell him, like, there was a wizard, and the the fat one said the princess was with child the one in the steel cap he had the torch he said that they had to hurry i think he was a wizard a wizard ned said unsmiling did he have a long white beard and a tall pointed hat speckled with stars no it was like old nan's stories he didn't look like a wizard but the fat one said he was so Arya's like trying to tell him of monsters and wizards and like none of this is making sense to ned but mm-hmm. how Okay, I'm struggling to understand how Ned didn't piece this together. When she says, they said, you had a book and a bastard, and if one hand could die, why not a second? He knows that he has a book. (laughs) He knows that he just found Robert's bastard. He knows that one hand has just died. (laughs) How does he not, like, I want to slap him sometimes. I'm telling you, Ned Stark has to be super 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 dumb because so sick. there's a lot God. of things that he doesn't piece together like Tyrion, that little finger telling Tyrion like he lost the cat's ball to Tyrion lannister because Tyrion bet on whoever beat jamie and Tyrion's like i never bet against my family so ned misses a lot of things things that are right in front of his face people saying things and he can't put it together. So Littlefinger says, Tyrion lost this to me when Jamie lost to the Knight of the Flowers or something like that. And then when Jamie loses to the Hound, Renly says, if the imp was here, I would have won twice as more. 
So that means that Tyrion always bets on Jamie, and Ned never right. put that together, and that was in Ned's POV. Right. So and he's he always missing. That him betting on Loras was like anything fishy with that. Like he's he's always missing shit. Like he can never. He's so put, dense. I I, I just slow minds. Quick temper. <laughs> 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 I just I just don't get it. Facts. So while. Arya's trying to tell him this stuff and, and Eddard is like, what the hell's going on? Like, he's just, it's too much. I like, really, I think it's just too much for Ned sometimes because he's just thrust into this awful position and situation where he's got to try to figure out so many things. Like he has a king that doesn't want to listen to him. He has John Aaron who's dead. Lysa who's missing. Stannis is gone. Like he's dealing with all of this shit. And then he has two daughters that he's also trying to raise at the same time. So he's got a lot going on, but then Yorin comes in and puts some more, about to throw some more shit on Ned Stark's plate. <laughs> <laughs> uh, poor Ned. So basically Yorin comes in and tells Ned that Catelyn has taken Tyrion, but also that Benjen is missing. Oh, so okay. he's got a lot on his plate. He does. He's he's got a lot going on that he can't talk to anybody about, you know, the business with the bastards and he's got all these other things that he's expected to do and duties he's expected to perform. So he's got all of you know his his court uh responsibilities but then he has all this stuff on the side happening Mm -hmm. and i think like you said that he just has so much going on that he is not really knowing where to focus his attentions and because of that he's focusing his intentions on the wrong places where he should be paying more attention he's just totally letting shit get by and that's ultimately what gets him killed yeah is he is not paying attention to the right people and even even Arya realizes how much danger they're in, like how much danger her father's in. She says, you wouldn't let anyone kill him, would you? She asked. Desmond laughed. No fear on that count, little lady. Lord Eddard's guarded night and day. He'll come to no harm. And Arya is so fucking smart that she's like, well, the Lannisters have more than 50 men. <laughs> and and they just tell her some bullshit like but every northerner is worth 10 of these southern swords so you can sleep easy like uh, right I, I don't know that just like <laughs> it's just pompous and so yeah. like so full of themselves like oh no yeah we're so much better we're so much better we're, we're there's no knights up there so we're like so much better <laughs> mm-hmm. and she says, well, what if a wizard is sent to kill him? And I think that this is foreshadowing that Varys is actually going to be beheaded. Mm-hmm. And it's yeah. wi- it says wizards die the same as other men once you cut their heads off. So I definitely yeah. think that Varys is going to be beheaded. Yeah, I, I don't think the uh, the Varys barbecue is likely to be his demise. I don't think he would um, put himself in enough of a position later, especially in late game. Yeah, to, you know, <laughs> be burned by a dragon. But someone lopping his head off, you know, that's... I, I feel like, I don't know, I feel like if he was standing in front of Daenerys and she was going to have Drogon, you know, scorched earth him, that he would find a way to talk himself out of it? I don't think that Varys and Daenerys will be on the same team come winds of winter because Varys is totally 100% playing for Aegon. Yeah. So unless Daenerys is going to marry Aegon or become team Aegon, which I don't foresee happening one, I don't think she's going to give up everything she's fought for this long to give to Aegon. Also, she has, she got that bit of info in the house of the undying, like beware of the mummer's dragon. Right. Eris was a mummer and Aegon is the mummer's dragon. Right. So I I think she's gonna have that in the back of her mind. And I also think it's destiny for Daenerys to end up with Jon Snow. So she can't be with Jon Snow and Aegon unless they're gonna be like sister husbands or brother husbands, <laughs> like Aegon Visenya and Rainey's kind of thing. Right. 
which even that would cause a whole uproar with the, the faith. So yeah, I don't know. Yeah. That would I would love that low. though. Like I'm not even gonna, like, I would love if that's what it was. If yeah, Daenerys is going to get two husbands. Heads. Right? Like, get it, girl. <laughs> <laughs> right? But, but, I mean, if... Do you think Danny's going to find out that she's Varys' plan B? No. I don't think she's going to want anything to do with Illyrio or Varys. <laughs> I don't think so either. And especially, like, when she just took Illyrio's ships. Yeah. And she's like, like she, well, he'll he'll be fine. <laughs> she's... I he think sent them to me. It'll be fine. The th- the issue that they are going to have with Daenerys is that Daenerys is, she's came into her own. She's not easily pliable. Like she's not easily just going to accept counsel from people. Aegon is going to accept what Illyrio tells him to do. He might accept what Varys tells him to do. Daenerys is going to question that shit. She's going to look at it from all different perspectives because that's what she does. Like she right. takes information she's- from Jorah and she takes information from Sir Barristan and then she makes her own decision based off of that information. She's not vi- Viserys where she's just going to fall for whatever Illyrio says. No, she's not the tractable little girl they want her to be. Yeah. And Fagon has been his whole life with John Collington being you know, protected and pampered and, and taught by, you know, a half maester and a septa and taking care of all this time where Danny has had to like fight for everything. She's, she's bled and starved for everything that she wants and she's mm-hmm. had other people to take care of. So she has that added responsibility of her Kalasar, her people, the slaves that she's freed. She has all of that weight on her. So she takes everything a little more seriously. Mm-hmm. It's not like Fagon just, you know, oh, I want to fight. Don't make me go below decks. She's, she's not accepting. You're not going to tell me what to do. I make my own decisions. Right. And, and there's a big difference between the two characters. And that's why I think they will never rock with her. <laughs> they will yeah. never rock with her like that. I don't think so either. Yeah. I just feel like Varys was on her side on the show because they didn't have Fagon. Fagon missing from this made a whole lot of the show not make sense so oh yeah I think think a couple characters missing made made a lot of (laughs) yeah but that's Arya that's Arya 3 chapter 32 do you guys have anything you want to add thank you for having us thank you so much for having us on no problem it was my pleasure and we will be linking the discord in the description box and in the comment section so you can join the discord and also you can contact Tubi at nim shadow on twitter she will be making an instagram as well to schedule i already made it i did it while we were talking Oh, what's the <laughs> what's the name? Nim Shadow. Same okay. thing. Keep it easy. Okay, same thing. At Nim Shadow on Instagram. And she will schedule you to co-host an episode of Obsidian Nights with me. And I will see you guys next week. Bye. Bye. Thank you so much.